Tumelang Sanvonani. Again, Tumelang Sanvonani. Buanji, Gomesta, Bonjour. Please do something for me. Close your eyes. Thank you. Can somebody tell me what they saw? If anything. No. Darkness. Right? I am here to give us an invitation. The idea that black women, African women, are a blank spot, a blind spot in the world of the economy. I'm here to suggest that we need new models, we need new ideas. I'm here to suggest that it is time for a revolution. A revolution that is going to unseat unbridled white male privilege from the spaces and the places that determine how the economy runs, that determine our choices, that determine our consumerism, that even determine the way that governments and states are run. I'm here to suggest that the very people to conduct this revolution with their many allies are black women. Who better? The ones who have been unseen, the ones who are the blind spots, the ones who reside in the darkness, the ones who are erased, marginalized, peripheralized. The good news is there are always answers. We're here to unseat, to dethrone the assumptions of markets, of classic economics that suggest that walala wasala, you snooze or you lose. Tough luck. I'm here to present us with what I call a beautiful love child. The love child between women's solutions and classical economics. I give you feminist economics. Feminist economics has two particular ethoses or principles that I'd like to share with us. The one is an ethic of love, and the other is an ethic of relationships. The love is a love that isn't soft and fluffy. It's a tenacious love. It's a courageous love. It's a fear fearless love. It's a fierce love. It's a love that has the courage to call out that which is unseen and that which is unspoken. It is a love that tries to deconstruct and reconstruct language. The things that women do are often counted or not counted. Care economics, care work, informal work. How insulting. There's nothing informal about waking up every morning at four in the morning and taking three taxis to get from one place to the next to sell your wares, to do the hustle. That is not informal. There is the notion that paid and unpaid work are completely different. There's the notion that the things that we do in the private space have no bearing on the things that happen in the public space. The economy is not about out here and right here. It's about us in the space as a collective. When we talk about domestic work, care work, invisible work, we are in deliberately invisibilizing it and naming it things that are less than honorable and dignified to justify perceiving them accordingly. Care work is stuff that needs to be done. I struggle with the term care work. Shopping has to be done. Groceries have to be bought. Children have to be taken to school. Beds have to be made. Food has to be cooked. People have to be cared for. Children must be loved. Things must be done. These things are the things which actually are not just about caring in a fluffy way. It's damn hard work. And it's the work that actually en en enables the mainstream, or what I call the mainstream economy, to function. And without this soft stuff, which isn't so soft, nothing else works and nothing else actually matters. So it's a love of courage, of vocabulary, of relanguaging, and of calling out firmly. It is a love that appreciates that there is 
no real distance. The politics of you know, the personal is always political. The public and the private do interface. Unpaid and paid work reside in the same space. How many of us here actually have a weekend hustle? A nine to five, beyond what we do nine to five? Who, is there anybody who does something on the side? And yet, mainstream economics, mainstream economics, mainstream economics would suggest that you're living in two different places and residing in two different experiences. And yet, as we, because women have superpowers, we reside in both concurrently. The second ethic of feminist economics is the ethic of relationships. The first relationship is our relationship with ourselves, our bodies, our self-awareness, our being. This, this relationship is critical because it shapes the way we present ourselves and the way we imagine ourselves. Face lightener, skin lightening, bulimia, anorexia, substance abuse, self-medication, alcoholism. All of these are symptoms of the fractured, complicated relationships, broken relationships that we often have with ourselves. And these relationships are often fueled by what we are fed in the mass media. You need to look a certain way. You need to be a certain size. Thank God for Miss Universe. Thank God for our girl. Had I known all those years ago when my dad was butchering my hair, looking like that one day, if I just keep it up, even me, I could be Miss Universe. <laughs> and the notion, of course, is that even now, um, so many years after market economics has become the mantra, we keep calling it different things. Some of us are old enough to remember structural adjustment, when states and the way that we do things were adjusted beyond recognition. We can call it globalization, we can call it free trade. Oksalayo, it is still about the attempts of corporates and northern countries to gain as much unfettered, unbridled access to southern um, resources and African resources, whether it's our brains, whether it's our diamonds, whether it's our minerals, whether it is our land, in all forms, it's an ongoing attempt to remain occupants of this economy and of lands in different ways. So, for how many years? 50 years, almost half a century? Some of the disciples of, um, we can call it market orthodoxy, we can call it new economics, we can call it free marketism, it doesn't really matter. It's all the same thing have been trying to tell us to tighten our belts. Um, and if you've ever tried to tighten your belt on Christmas Day, <laughs> you'll know what a difficult undertaking that is. It hurts, huh? So we've been tightening like, Eesh! you know, for 50 years. And if we do this, um, the economic rational man on which all of this is based tells us that we're going to get better social benefits that there's going to be economic redistribution, that our states should step back, and that they should have no part in mediating unequal social economic power relations. The markets are flawless. The markets are rational. The markets never fail. Well, 2008, who remembers that moment? And all of this logic is not at all, it's not coincidental. So this notion that you know, every time ratings agencies come to town, and those who've read some of my work will know that I have a very limited brief for ratings agencies. Because like agencies and institutions like the WTO, the IMF, this is really a representation of minority rule. We can call it white privilege, we can call it new colonialism, but it's basically minority rule who determine the lives and the economic and social outcomes for most of humanity. Nobody votes for them. We hardly know what their names are. Some shady guys in Brussels, New York, London, wherever they are, and we know nothing about them. And yet, we all go out in hives. We can't sleep because the ratings agencies are coming. What are they going to say about us this time? Is it a downgrade? Is it a sidegrade? Is it an upgrade? What is it? Hmm? Um, and then when you link this with the fact that, in fact, 
over the last half a century since structural adjustment and this kind of economics has come about, we've actually got seen a, a place where the rich are getting unbridled wealth, much richer, and where those who are marginalized, invisibilized, dispossessed, are even more marginalized and peripheralized than they ever were before. Shorthand would say the poor get poorer, but I don't think they're poor, I think they're robbed. So the, 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 the new mantra then is also then bolstered by huge international monopolies, which then make it very difficult for smaller entrants to come into the frame. When we talk about global value chain or value chains, why is it that we always go into over there mode? A global value chain or a value chain can be me going 10 meters down the road to buy a laptop that was produced locally, rather than having an apple, and I do have an apple, um, or any other kind of, uh, of laptop. But this illustrates the extent to which huge multinationals now and corporations, many of which have more power than states, many of which have more value than entire countries' GDPs, by the way, are exerting huge amounts of power. Um, and influence over the way we consume, what we see in the media, the food that we eat, the things that we wear, the way we imagine ourselves. Remember the skin lightening and the bulimia? All of that stuff is tied into a machinery of there is no other alternative. This is the only way to be. And feminist economics stands as a reproach and as a critique that suggests that there are many ways to be. I don't know, there are about 100 people in this room so it means that there are at least a hundred ways to be. It is not the cookie cutter approach to life and to being. The GDP can't even adequately express us and express the complexity of living life in this planet at this time. Even the World Economic Forum last year, 2018, there was a funny quote by some dude who said that trying to compress economic growth and economic realities into two digits is like trying to put a frog into a matchbox. For anybody else here who's also felt like a compressed, claustrophobic amphibian, it is true indeed that the complexity of our lives can't be really compounded in this way, especially because of what GDP counts and what it doesn't count. It counts war. It counts environmental degradation. Remember what I said about our relationship with the Earth? and the planet that is so angry already. It counts pornography. It counts cigarette advertising. Things what many, that many societies may view as unhealthy and perhaps slightly toxic, but it's not interested in the quality of activity. It's just do anything, which is why the GDP in some countries goes up during times of war and during times of destruction, during times of trauma. It is a kind of a perverse operization of poverty and of, you know, you get a war, you get a war, you get a war, you're going to grow, you're going to grow at any cost. So we need to look at other measures. The GDP doesn't tell us about our good marriages, our loving children. It doesn't even count the quality of health. It just says that we're getting health care, but not what the quality of it is the quality of that education. It doesn't count the beautiful poetry that's contained within us. It doesn't even count our lovely, our courage. It doesn't count our capacity to wake up at four o'clock in the morning and do stuff. Because hustleomics is not part of how we count what's counted in the GDP and in mainstream, mainstream, mainstream economics. So I suggest and feminist economics says that we can think and de describe things in new ways and fresh ways. Fortunately, it's a language of love that also has the capacity not to try to define, but to describe. So let's rethink poverty and let's rethink abundance. Poverty is not only about material things, although that's important, but it's much more complicated than $1.75 in your pocket per day. Sometimes poverty is loneliness. Poverty is anger. Poverty is waking up feeling like you don't want to. Poverty is going to sleep hoping that you never wake up again. Poverty is feeling like you're far from your family. Poverty is, not f is feeling as though 
You don't have agency over your life. You don't have choice. Poverty may be feeling a sense of alienation from everything around you. In the same light, in the same hand, how do we measure abundance and wealth? Surely it's much more about, it's much more than bling and your new car and where you live and overseas holidays. And that's the kind of vapid, empty consumerism that the new high priests are trying to force down our throats. And I look at people like your Zuckerbergs and your, and your, and your, your Bill Gates, and to me they seem very similar to your Columbuses of a generation ago. Because the, those guys were, came to colonize lands that were physical, these chaps are colonizing ideas and data and spaces and futures. Even the way that we imagine work is changing all the time. So if we think about abundance, we think about a space of choice. I would like to suggest that abundance and wealth is the love of family. Abundance and wealth, I feel like in this moment, I'm having such a wealthy moment, such a love, such an abundance in this moment, in this room. It is the ability to access choices. It's the ability to have, be with your children. It's feeling healthy. It's food in your stomach. It's money in the bank, yes, but it's also time, leisure, a moment to write a poem, to sing a song, to dance, to love really loudly, and to just belly laugh, like ha ha ha, not just <laughs> but belly laugh, <laughs> yeah? Belly laugh properly, the levity to do it. So I leave us with this, I leave us with two or three ideas. The one is, let's rethink how we're engaging with this economy. Let's make consumer choices which perhaps help us to rethink the value chain and what value actually is. The second choice is let's take our pulpits here and there and everywhere. People of faith, people in the marketplace, people in the corporate. Can we reimagine what a world would look like if women counted in the economy? How does that look? What does that feel like? What is the messaging that we're going to give and thirdly, what is the curricula that we can give to younger people, some of the brilliant people who are on this stage this morning? What is the languaging that we can give and what is the curricula of change? What is the curricula of rethinking, recentering, and reimagining? So this is our love child, feminist economics. It is everything, and the revolution is now. Thank you. <laughs>